All right. All right. Now, I think this should be working. The microphone should be good. I think everybody should be able to hear me. Let me guys know in the comments if you can hear me, please. Uh, sorry about that, guys. I just started a stream a few minutes ago, and I was muted for the first two minutes, so that was great. Uh, now I'm going to get to repeat myself a little bit, but what's up, you guys? I'm Tony Metro. Welcome to the live stream. Let me know. Can you hear me well? How's the microphone sound, Max? Everything sound okay, or should I make some changes to the settings right now? I think it's a lot better. I'm getting some uh, feedback, and it sounds like it, it seems to be pretty good to me. Very good. All right, guys. Well, welcome to the stream. We're going to be talking about the Mets and the recent rumors surrounding them and Chicago Cubs third baseman Chris Bryant, as well as free agent starting pitcher Dejan Walker. I'm your host, Tony Metro. We're going to be going through these guys, talking about some of their stats, some of the rumors that we've been hearing about them, and see if it'll be a good fit for the Mets. Right now, the Mets have not made a move, or a big one at least in a little while. Really, the only big moves that they had uh, was to get Carlos Carrasco and Francisco Lindor. Otherwise, they've had some other minimal signings, but some big ones that have really filled some big holes for the team. Um, and so let's see if the Mets can put an exclamation mark on this free agency, on this offseason, and really put them in a in, in a position to win the National League East and beyond. Uh, Brian, welcome. Thanks, man. Really appreciate you checking in and being a fan. Thank you to all you guys for checking in. Really, it means a lot to me. It's it's humbling to have so many people that you know appreciate the work. Frankie, same for you. Max, Luis, welcome to the stream, guys. So let's see what's going on. First, we heard all the rumors about Chris Bryant. As far back as January 6th, Andy Martino reported that the Mets were looking at Chris Bryant. They were talking with Chicago Cubs. And even at that time, Andy Martino said that a Chris Bryant trade could happen as early as that weekend on January 6th. Um, of course, Chris Bryant is still on the Chicago Cubs. But just Thursday afternoon, we heard that the Mets and the Cubs had re-engaged on a trade for Chris Bryant. So where does that leave us now? Obviously, it's been a couple of days since. Doesn't seem like there's been a lot of news on it. It's actually been a lot of contrasting reports. You have some sources that are saying, you know, there's very a lot of smoke a deal could potentially get done before spring training then you have the other side of the aisle that's saying mm, not so much doesn't seem like the cubs are extremely interested on trading brian unless they get overwhelmed by a trade now the other part about this is that there's kyle hendricks who a lot of people are very interested in a lot of teams he is a very pitcher friendly or team friendly contract he's a very good starting pitcher probably slides in as a number two or a number three in the mets rotation now, if the Mets were to get involved with Chris Bryant and Kyle Hendricks, that would be a much more costly trade because Hendricks is under control for three more years. Like I said, his, his contract is very team friendly. I think he's only making about $15 million over each of the next three seasons. And compared to what free agent starting pitchers are getting right now in the open market, Hendricks has got a great contract for a team. So just putting Hendricks aside for a moment, let's take a look at Chris Bryant and let's look at his stats. Uh, of course, the 2016 MVP of the National Unfortunately, things have not been going in the and since that 2016 campaign. In that year, he had a 939 OPS, 146 OPS plus, slugged 39 home runs, 102 RBIs. But that's the only season that he's ever had 102 runs batted in in a single season. So What's what's led to this downfall of Chris Bryant? Well, in 2017, he missed, or rather 2018, he missed quite a bit of time. He only played 102 games. That's because he had a shoulder injury. And what's happened since then is a lot of people have believed that that shoulder injury has had lingering effects on his career and that his power numbers are still slumping because of it. So who is Chris? Is he the guy that was 2015, 2016 MVP caliber type guy? Or is he the one over the last few years who in 2019, 2018 still had pretty good numbers, had an 874 OPS, a 128 OPS plus over those two years had a combined 44 home runs and 129 RBIs. Not exactly eye-dropping numbers. I mean, he had 249 games played, so that averages out to 22 home runs and roughly 65 RBIs per season, 70 RBIs per season. 
So not exactly the most crazy numbers. What he does bring is very good defense at third base. Um, for my money, I still say Nolan Arenado is the best third baseman in baseball. Obviously, he's out of the question. He got traded to St. Louis. He's going to be there now for the long term. Um, as far as Matt Chapman, we've also heard the Mets are interested in Chapman, but I don't really see the athletics sending him away, even though they do send their young players away before they get too expensive. Uh, I think that would be a huge prospect trade if the Mets or any other team wants to acquire Chapman. But as for Chris Bryant, going into the final season uh, before free agency, he might be able to be had on a much cheaper deal. So let's take a look at some of the Mets' top prospects and try to see if we can formulate a trade for Chris Bryant and the Cubs. The Mets, of course, don't have the strongest farm system. They're right now ranked about 23rd by some of the pundits out there. Uh, it's top heavy. The Mets have a really solid one through six, probably maybe one through seven. But after that, it really starts to tail off. You have Ronnie Mauricio, Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty, Matthew Allen, Pete Crow Armstrong. And then you could throw in any mix of JT Ginn or the newly acquired Khalil Lee into those top seven. After that, it starts to tail off. There's not a whole lot of interesting names that go after number seven. You have a guy like Thomas Sapucky, who's a left-handed pitcher. He's ready to make his debut now. He actually is coming off Tommy John surgery a few years ago, as well as some back issues. His career minor league numbers are really good, but again, he's a little injury prone and he doesn't have all the draft prospect type like another guy, say Brett Beatty or Matthew Allen has. So he wouldn't really maybe be as interesting of a name for the Cubs. Here's the thing. Chris Bryant's free agent after this season. He's Scott Boris client. He's going to get a huge contract this offseason. We know that. Or at least Scott Boris will be shooting for the stars for his client like he always does. So what could the Mets send back? For me personally, I'm not sending any of those top five guys for a rental player in Chris Bryant. I'm not sending Fran Ronnie Mauricio, Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty, Matthew Allen, or Pete Crow Armstrong. They're all off limits in a trade for Chris Bryant. If they add Kyle Hicks to that deal well, I might be more inclined to send someone like Brett Beatty or maybe Ronnie Mauricio. I actually would prefer to send Mauricio. I'm not too keen on him. I know he's ranked as the Mets number one prospect, but I just don't know if I see it. He's probably going to transition to third base anyway, and he's only 19 years old right now. Highest level of play was at A ball, so he's still many years away from debuting. Probably won't be ready till at the earliest the all-star break in 2023. So he's a little bit away. I would be willing to do Mauricio if it meant getting Hendricks as well as Chris Bryant. But let's focus just on Chris Bryant trade right now. He's doing $19.5 million. The Mets are about $30 million under the luxury tax threshold. They're still trying to stay a below it so they can extend Francisco Lindor as well as Michael Conforto heading into next offseason. They'll also be losing Noah Syndergaard and Marcus Stroman. I don't think they have much intent on extending Marcus Stroman despite, you know, even if he has a very good season, I think they'd opt to bring Noah Syndergaard back on an extension, but that hinges on his Tommy John, you know, and how he returns from Tommy John surgery. So, $19.5 million for Chris Bryant. The Mets are probably going to have to find a way to send Yuri's Familia back or Dellen Betances. They're the two guys that are creating such a logjam on this roster, along, of course, with Robinson Cano, who is not going anywhere. No one wants Robinson Cano for $20 million next year and the year after that, coming off back-to-back PED bus, getting you know busted and suspended for steroids once again. So, if the Mets were able to make a trade involving, say, Yuri's Familia, Familia is making $11 million this year. He's basically dead weight. He doesn't throw strikes. He's a terrible reliever, in my opinion. I was very upset when the Mets brought him back. Brody re-signed him, of course. But now his contract is making it difficult for the Mets to navigate the rest of this offseason. So if the Mets were able to send Yuri's Familia, send $5 million to the Cubs, in addition to J.D. Davis, and then a lower-level prospect, say a guy like mm, Mark Vientos, the third-base prospect. He's currently ranked as the Mets' number seven prospect on MLB.com. This doesn't account for uh, Khalil Lee, who was just acquired from the Royals. He'd probably be the sixth or seventh prospect in the Mets' system. So Vientos probably bumps down to eight or nine. Uh, Vientos, highest level of play is at A ball. He does have an ETA of 2022. Six-foot-four, third baseman, weighs 185 pounds. 
his uh, green scale for his tools, a power rating of 60. This goes from 20 to 80. His arms rating is 60. Hit rating 45. Fielding 50. So the thing on Vientos, he doesn't have a lot of hype from other people around the league. His slash line in 2019, his first half slash line was 240, 286. 364. Then after the All-Star break, really turned it around in the second half of 2019, had a 271 average, 315 OBP, and a 462 slugging percentage. Um, so he is not going to be a superstar player. It doesn't sound like at least, but he sounds like he could be a serviceable third baseman. So he's the guy that I'd be willing to trade if the Mets were also going to be getting rid of Yuri's Familia's contract and getting Chris Bryant back, their third baseman, even if it's only for 2021. Um, you get Chris Bryant and you put him on this team. This lineup is eight deep going from Nimmo, Lindor, Conforto, Pete Alonso, Dom Smith, maybe in left field. Uh, who else am I forgetting? Uh, see Jeff McNeil, Pete Alonso, if I already mentioned him, James McCann. And then, of course, Chris Bryant at third base. That is one of the most lethal lineups in baseball and the Mets defense on the left side of the infield is arguably the best in baseball. So that's a trade I'd be willing to do. The Mets send $5 million in cash plus Yuri Familia plus JD Davis and Mark Vientos to the Cubs for Chris Bryant. So that means the Mets will be getting out from Yuri Familia, $11 million contract. They take on 19 and a half million from Chris Bryant. They also send 5 million. So the Mets would be having, would be getting a net, savings of 24 and a half minus 11 about 13 and a half million the Mets would be adding in payroll and they'd still be well below the luxury tax they still have the ability to go out find some more relief pitching which after the injury to Seth Lugo I think is something they have to do um, and then of course also take a look at some of the starting pitching options like Tejon Walker who is uh, one of the topics of this stream here. If you guys are just joining, thank you for coming on. We're talking about the Chris Bryant rumors to the Mets as well as Tejon Walker. I appreciate you guys. SBF, what's up, man? I got a Braves fan in the chat. I like that. What's going on, man? I think your guys' team is way too good to be ranked 82 wins by Pakota. That is so wrong. The Braves are not an 82 win team. They should easily eclipse 90, if not higher, 95, 97. They're a great team. Uh, Mark, what's up, man? Welcome. Um, Let's take a look. What's going on in the chat? If the Mets want Hendricks, they might have to trade Carrasco, Seawald, or Robertson. Well, Seawald's no longer with the team, Max. He actually, I believe, was DFA'd. Uh, Carrasco, I don't think, will be going anywhere. Uh, you know, the Cubs are looking probably, if they're trading Chris Bryant, to shed some payroll, and they're probably looking to get some prospect capital back to start building back up toward their future. Um, see him getting traded at all. I don't think it would really make sense for the Mets or for the Cubs. It'd be a lateral move to do Carrasco for Hendricks, honestly. Um, very similar contract, very similar players. I don't really think it's something that the Cubs would be interested in. And quite frankly, I don't think I'd want to. Um, let's take a look here. Who what do we got here? <clears throat> yeah, Pakoda is pretty bad. I don't know what they were thinking. 82 wins for the Braves. I mean, that's just so wrong. It's so wrong. I mean, you got Austin Riley, Kristen Pond out in left field. You brought back Marcelo Zuna. The Braves just are one of those teams that are so well run. They play tremendous defense in the field. They have a ridiculous lineup that just keeps nickel and diming you until they get a big blast from either Acuna or Freeman or, you know, anyone else in that lineup is capable of hitting bombs. And you guys pitching is it always is. I know the bullpen wasn't so good last year, but usually your guys' bullpen is pretty locked down. It usually shuts the Mets down. What's up, you guys? Thank you for joining. Appreciate you guys. If you're not already subscribed to my channel, be sure to do that. Stay up to date on all the latest Mets and MLB news, and be sure to leave this stream a like. We also do live streams every Thursday during the week, I believe at 6 or 7 p.m. Eastern time. We've been fluctuating on that. It's me, Mets fans only, as well as Mets fan from YouTube, Frank about sports, and a few other guys. Jolly Olive's another one. And uh, you guys can find that link on my Twitter, which is Tony Metro MLB. Um, really appreciate all you guys joining. So let's go over now and talk a little bit about Tejon Walker. So the Mets were interested in James Paxton. They actually did put an offer into him, but they were outbid by Seattle, who signed him for $10.5 million. 
uh, rather, it was actually eight and a half million guaranteed, and it could be up to ten or ten and a half million if he hits his incentives, which was pitching in ten games or pitching in twenty games, and so on and so forth. So I personally like James Paxton. When I started this offseason, one of the big moves I wanted the Mets to make was to bring James Paxton in. He has some really good numbers despite all the injuries that he's had over the years. And for that price, I definitely would have taken a risk on him. The Yankees signed Corey Kluber for $11 million. So I don't see why the Mets or another team wouldn't be willing to give James Paxton a shot at $8.5 million. So good move for the Mariners. I don't think they're ready to compete, but it's a good move nonetheless as far as value uh, and the price they're going to be paying for him for that one year. And if he performs well for them, they could flip him at the deadline, try to get prospects back that's old news now the Mets are not going to have James Paxton of course so now really the only remaining free agent starting pitcher target that I'm interested in at would be Dejan Walker so Walker came up he had some serious hype about him when he first came into the league with the Seattle Mariners um career really did begin and start off on a good note he was 20 years old in 2013 and in 2020, or sorry, 13 and 2014, made a combined eight starts, had a ERA of, let's see here, 2.89, an ERA plus of 128. His FIP was 3.28. I mean, everything checked out. He had good strikeout numbers. His walks were a little high, 3.7 walks per nine. Um, so really looked like he was going to blossom into one of the best starting pitchers in the league but unfortunately his career has taken a bit of a downturn since then 2015 through 2018 let's go and take a look at his numbers his era was usually sitting in the mid fours in between seattle and arizona where he eventually i believe he was traded to he might have signed with them i can't recall exactly but made 85 starts and in that time had a 4.08 era uh, his ERA plus 103. Now we all know ERA plus, if you don't know, basically is measured on a scale of 100 being league average. So anything above that is percentage above average. So if his ERA plus is 103, that means 3% above league average. So that's not exactly eye popping. A guy like Jacob DeGrom is going to have like a 156 ERA plus 145 ERA plus. So Really nothing too impressive there. Um, and the problem for Walker, it looks like, at least based on his stats, was, again, he was walking a lot of guys. Um, not quite as bad. It was 2.7 per nine innings. But his strikeout numbers were pretty low during that time. Wasn't striking out a whole lot of guys. Just 8.2 per nine. Um, he did come back in 2020 and have a very solid season with both Toronto and Seattle. Seattle traded him midway through the year, and he went to Toronto and performed very well. His overall numbers for the 2020 season, he made 11 starts, had a 2.70 ERA in 53 and a third innings pitched, had a 4.56 FIP though. So those numbers are a little concerning. The fielding independent pitching indicates when a pitcher would be taking away from all the defense behind him from the park factors and all those other things so if his FIP is higher than his ERA it probably means that he wasn't actually pitching as well as ERA indicated so that's a little concerning to me but given the fact that he'd probably be brought in by the Mets as a fourth or fifth starter for the rotation ultimately until Noah Syndergaard returns I'd definitely be interested in bringing Tyjon Walker in let's go over to baseball Savant I'm going to take a look at some of his metrics I know he has some pretty nasty numbers and some really impressive spin rate on his fastball and RPMs, all that stuff. I don't get too deep into the weeds on that because sometimes it can just really take away from the bottom line, which is your, your numbers, your ERA, your FIP, your WHIP, your K per nine. And when we get too caught up in, you know, this guy's got uh, 17,000 revolutions per minute on his curveball, like I just – that gets to be too much for me, but it is important when you're looking at a guy and you want to project what he could be in the future. So let's go take a look. He has a, how many pitches does he throw? Let's take a look here. Hmm. Five pitch mix, forcing fastball, a cutter, split finger sinker, and a curve ball. He mixes them in all pretty well. Fastball 38% of the time makes sense. Cutter 21%. Split finger, he throws it 18% of the time. His sinker, 11%, and his curveball, 10%. So really nice mix there. Does a little bit of everything. 2020, taking a look at his metrics. Uh, his exit velocity was only in the 50th percentile, so not exactly the best. 
Hard hit percentage was much better. That's in the 74th percentile. So that's pretty good. Uh, most of the other metrics are not exactly eye popping. They're for the most part below 50% for his ex Woba, his uh, ex ERA, his weighted batting average, weighted slugging percentage. Uh, his barrel percentage was 48%. So not the best, but not the worst. His numbers, again, the ERA was good, but the fit indicated didn't pitch as well as he might have, uh, his numbers might have shown. So if Tejon Walker would take a deal for, say, seven to ten million dollars i'm guessing he'll probably get the higher end of that maybe nine or ten million dollars i could definitely see the mets bringing him in and him being an effective four or fifth starter for this rotation um what do you guys think would tejon walker be the final piece to the mets rotation um that would basically give them jacob Degrom, carlos carrasco marcus stroman david peterson joey lucchese jordan yamamoto uh, a couple other guys they brought in, I believe uh, Trevor Richardson. Is that his name? Yeah, Trevor Richardson, who they signed. Uh, they might actually see him more of a swingman that does some uh, long relief for the team down the road. Um, and, and Tejon Walker, if they brought him in. They'd have some really good depth. And then, of course, eventually Noah Syndergaard will be returning from Tommy John surgery, hopefully by May or June, just depending on how his rehab goes. So what would you guys think? about Tejon Walker coming to the Mets. Would that be a good piece for the Mets to fill out their rotation? Ted Quinn, what's up, my man? I appreciate you joining. Welcome. Mark, I'm telling you, man, that rotation is good. The Braves rotation is should not be slept on, man. Soroka, Freed, Morton, Anderson, Smiley, it, it's a solid rotation. I said in uh, our live stream the other day, our Mets fan only uh, – live stream uh, max freed actually went to high school very close to me and uh he struck me out in high school he's really good <laughs> all right but i struck out on four pitches i took a ball but then i swung and missed at the last three that was there was no chance i could not do it he the guy's a beast and i also was actually college or rather high school teammates with christian yelich he was i grew up with christian yelich and we were high school teammates uh great guy and he still lives nearby and i see him every now and then really really awesome guy Let's see. Castillo rumors. Luis Castillo. Wow. If the Mets got Luis Castillo, this freaking rotation is the best in baseball. I don't care about the Dodgers getting Trevor Bauer. Luis Castillo joining this rotation would be nice. Now, I've been on record saying that I think Castillo is a little overrated because some people have put him out there as a top 10 pitcher in baseball. I'm not sure if I believe that. I did have him as one of the most overrated players in one of my earlier videos this offseason. But he's a very good pitcher nonetheless. I definitely take him. I personally just think that it's going to cost a lot for the Mets to get Luis Castillo from the Reds. He's under contract still for quite a few more years. And I mean, it's just tough to figure out though, because what direction are the Reds going in? They let Trevor Bauer walk. Uh, they last year signed though for Nick Castellanos or traded for Nick Castellanos two years ago. He's got and re-signed him last off season. So to me, I'm not really sure that whole National League Central is up in the air. It could go to anybody. It's probably going to be the Cardinals. But it seems like everyone in that division is not really trying to, to win. It seems like they're doing their best to not win, in fact. Um, that being said, I'm not interested in Eugenio Suarez, the third baseman for the Reds. That's been another subject of rumors for the Mets, uh, both Suarez and Castillo. I like Castillo. I don't like Suarez. Suarez has got, I know, 49 home run bat, but he plays in the friendly hitter confines of Great American Ballpark. City Field, not exactly that hitter friendly to right-handed hitters. Um, I could see him coming here and being a dud, only hitting maybe 20, 22 home runs to left field. He got a big win factor at City Field coming in from the Bay. Um, and he's not a tremendous, he's not a very good defensive third baseman either. Um, I, I'm definitely more keen on getting Chris Bryant. Um, in addition to the fact that he is a free agent, and if he did walk next year, the Mets could recoup a consolation pick if he did sign with a different team. So we'll see about that. Trevor Rosenthal and Justin Wilson for the pen. Uh, Frankie, man, from your lips to God's ears. Dude, I've been talking about this. I've been saying for a long time, even before Lugo's injury, that this bullpen still scares me. I mean, they brought in Trevor May, which was great. But other than that, I still don't trust Edwin Diaz to get a big out. I mean, he still proved last year to crumble under pressure more often than not. I know he only blew two saves, only gave up, what, two, three home runs throughout the year in the shortened season. But that was without fans in the stadium. And it seems like everything with Edwin Diaz is right here between the ears. He's got uh, this mental 
thing that's just holding him back. It's a confidence issue. I'm fully, fully believe that. And he also does struggle to find the strike zone at times and he ends up to serve up pitches down the plate. So I still don't trust him as far as familia dude can't find a friggin' strike zone for his life flutters that sinker, that little uh, split finger that he has right down the middle. Every time they, they know to lay off it now. I mean, when he first came up, Familia was effective because that splitter was nasty. Now everyone's like, oh, it's going to fall out of the bottom of the strike zone. Take it for a ball, wait for wait to get that fastball right down the plate. Batances, who knows about Dellen Batances, man. Just another guy the Mets bring in from the Yankees that's just – Kaput doesn't really have it anymore. Last year going to spring training was not even touching 95, and we were all, oh, he's a slow streak. takes time to get that velo back up. Well, never really got it back up, and who knows if he's really going to pitch very much at all for this team this year or be effective. Um, so now with Lugo hurt, missing probably the first month, month, two months of the season maybe, they definitely got to add some more guys. Trevor Rosenthal would be awesome. Um, someone proposed recently that they could get him on a minor league deal. I don't believe that. He's 30 years old. Had a very strong 2020. Definitely to see Trevor Rosenthal signing a major league contract with a team. Um, let's see. Justin Wilson, we heard today that the Mets were in deep negotiation talks with free agent relief pitcher Justin Wilson. But we also heard that the Yankees deep in talks with Justin Wilson. He's played with both teams. He was with the Yankees a few years ago. He spent the last two years with the Mets, was extremely effective in 2019 for the Mets. Last year, a little up and down, not quite as good, but I would welcome Justin Wilson back. We right now only have one lefty in the bullpen. That's Aaron Loop. We also could bring in uh, Joey Lucchese into the bullpen as well. Otherwise, I think the only other starting pitcher, or rather left-handed pitcher we have on the 40-man roster is oh his name escapes me right now i can't think of his name right now it'll come back to me but the mets could definitely could use some more relief pitching i'm in agreement with you on that one sugar is gonna rebound have faith bro man i'm I, yo as a as a mets and knicks fan like me man like we we have faith but like we've been burned by our two teams a lot all right so like i gotta see it first I got to see it. I'm, I'm a skeptic, man. Look, yeah, this even says right here, skepticism on my sweater, man. Like, I got to see my team do it before I'm going to say, yeah, it's happening. You know what I mean? I've just been burned by these guys too much. Mets, Jets, Nick, I've seen it all, every possible way to lose, and I've had my heart broken many times. And speaking of which, happy Valentine's Day to you guys. I hope you're all spending it with your loved one. And if you're single like me, then let's go find a loved one today, huh? Let's make today the day. Let's see what else we got going on here. Ooh, Frankie Diaz, low-key good signing as Walker, that fifth starter. He pitched well for Toronto. He did pitch well for Toronto last year. Um, I would take a chance on on Tejon Walker. Why not? As the fourth or fifth starter in the rotation? Absolutely. The more starting pitching you can have, the better. And a lot of people may be forgetting, this is a 60 – last year was a 60-game season. A lot of these guys had weird ramp-up, you know, that second spring training they had, summer camp they called it. There were a lot of injuries last year, and I think a lot of guys are going to be, you know, facing some injuries this year as well. It's going to be another weird offseason. It has been, and I think it'll be another weird spring training. So the more starting pitching depth that we can possibly have, the better. That's what's great about the Joey Lucchese deal, and that's why the Mets EFA Brad Brock, I believe, instead of Robert Gesellman, because Joey Lucchese has options. He can go to AAA. He can take a minor league assignment if the Mets give it to him. Same goes for Robert Gesellman. He has one option left. So if the Mets want to stash those guys away in AAA, bring in some more guys like Tejon Walker. Uh, they've already brought in some other starting pitchers like Jordan Yamamoto, who probably doesn't make the team. They can put these guys in AAA or on a taxi squad if that's a situation that they have. You can never have too much starting pitching. You're absolutely right there, Ted Quinn, 100%, man. Never can. In a normal year, we're talking you're going through at least eight starting pitchers minimum, maybe even nine, because there's going to be injuries. There's going to be scratch starts. There's going to be guys that, you know, just – need a day off or whatever. So on this season, having such a weird off season, such a weird 2020 season, I fully believe the Mets are going to need at least nine or 10 starting pitchers to give us five starts at minimum. So, you know, you'll probably get 30 from DeGrom. You'll probably get hopefully 30 from Stroman if he doesn't bow out again because, you know, COVID. Uh, and then the same probably can be said for Carlos Carrasco, as long as they're all staying healthy. Um, then you're going to need to get some a couple more starts, obviously, from the other guys like Joey Lucchese, Yamamoto maybe, uh, could be Trevor Rosenthal, so or not Rosenthal, sorry, Trevor Richardson. 
Um, so we'll, we'll just see how it all plays out. But, yeah, never going to have too much starting pitching. Let's take a look. I love the Khalil Lee trade. What a robbery. I got to say, man, I love the trade. Uh, the Mets sent back Adrian Winkowski, I believe his name is. No, John Winkowski, who uh, they had just acquired for the Steven Match trade. He was kind of the headliner that the Mets were getting back in the Steven Match trade. And he probably would have been ranked maybe the 10th or 11th best prospect in the Mets system. Um, but overall, wasn't really a head turner. Then they turned that guy into their 7th best prospect in Khalil Lee who I don't know if he's going to really have much of an offensive profile. He sounds like at his best, he'll be a guy like Aaron Hicks. At his worst, might just be kind of like a lesser version of Jock Peterson because he strikes out quite a bit and you know he does have a little bit of pop. He hasn't really developed into it yet. His OBP is okay, but he strikes out a ton. That's his big problem. So he's got to get that under control. The good thing I read about him is that he does have – deep counts he does go into deep counts and sees a lot of pitches it's just his pitch selection on what to hit is not good and so if he can work on that and develop that he can actually turn into a very good player so really happy about Khalil Lee wouldn't be surprised if we see him on this team some point this season let's take a look here we got are you kidding me huh? okay welcome to the chat I like the username uh appreciate you guys all joining by the way if you're new to my channel be sure to like this stream and subscribe to my channel I'm so close to 600. I'm trying to catch up to all my other peers that are in the Mets fan only YouTube subscription uh, stream. I'm well behind them. So I'm trying to get up to 600. Make sure you smash that subscribe button and keep, keep in tune for all the latest Mets and MLB news. Um, are you kidding me? Huh? What is your minimum expectation for the Mets in the NL East? Third wild card. I mean, my minimum expectation is for them to win the NL East. I mean, I'm not ready to say this offseason's done. I mean, at this point, I wouldn't say the Mets are the favorites yet. I still think the Braves are the better team. They play better defense. They usually have a much better rotation and pitching staff in that lineup, man. They can just cut you apart, you know, death by a thousand cuts, or they can do it with a bomb. So the Braves, to me, are still the best team in the National League East. That being said, the Mets are not done this offseason. I still see a big trade happening, like the subject of this stream right now Chris Bryant maybe a Eugenio Suarez or Luis Castillo or Kyle Hendricks I could see any of those four guys being brought into this team so for me personally you know they have now the richest owner in baseball they brought in Francisco Lindor Jacob deGrom's in the prime of his career this is the time to try to capitalize and go out and make a World Series appearance win a World Series so my expectations are National League East champs or bust if they make the wild card great I'm fine with that I'd be very happy with that but I'm not third place. Some really bad stuff happened if they finish in third place this year. I'd be really disappointed if they didn't win. I right now have the Mets as the team is currently constructed at a ceiling of 95 wins. That's the max I think they'd win with this current roster. Worst case scenario, I see them winning 88 games, 87 games. So somewhere between there, you know, if they can eclipse 90, fully expect them to make the playoffs. The National League West is, other than the Dodgers and Padres, pretty weak. You got the Rockies, you got the D-backs, you got the Giants who had a good year last year, but I kind of think they're pretenders. Uh, so yeah, Padres, Dodgers going to be really two really good teams. Then in the Central, you have the Cardinals, and then you have about five piles of dog shit. And then you have the Cubs and the Reds and the Pirates and the Brewers. I mean, I don't want to be too hard on them. The Cubs are actually still a good team, I think. But the Cardinals are definitely a clear-cut favorite. Those other teams really have not been making moves. Uh, Reds have lost Trevor Bauer. They really added much. The Brewers really haven't done a whole ton. Uh, Pirates are – do I even need to say anything about the Pirates? They're going to be terrible, probably lose close to 100 games this year. Um, and then – Going into the National League East, uh, the Mets and the Braves, the clear-cut two best teams. The Nationals could have a bounce back, though I did predict last year that they were going to finish in fourth place. And I think under a normal season, I would have been right. I think they got third, but they were not a good team. They were under 500. The Phillies really are the same team as last year. They brought back JT Real Muto. They brought back D.D. Gregorius. Um, and then you have the Marlins, who... I just don't think that was a legit season last year. I don't think that they were are actually ready to make a playoff uh, in a real season. So I'm not worried about, uh, you know, any of the guys in the National League East other than the Braves. Um, definitely see the, the Mets in on a wild card spot if they can't make the uh, – if they don't win the National League East. Uh, 
Texas Rangers report by center field media. If you guys aren't subbed to that guy, go ahead and sub to him. He's awesome. He makes some great content. I didn't see anything about a Jose Lallaire trade. I don't know if uh, that's you asking me if they should do it or if I'm missing something, but I haven't heard anything about Jose Lallaire. Uh, I believe he's a relief pitcher. Is that right? He is. I've, I've done some research on the Lyric before, and I know the Mets were interested in last year when the Mets and the Rangers uh, came together on a trade for uh, our old friend Todd Frazier and Robinson Chirinos. Let's see. Well, he pitched two innings last year, 4.50 ERA. Uh, 2019, he appeared in 70 games, 4.33 ERA. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't really think the Mets are going to be in the business of trading for relief pitching. It's really not a uh, economic way to spend prospect capital. You know, you usually can bring a guy up from your farm system or try to just sign some free agents for the bullpen because, you know, perfect example of the Edwin Diaz trade, man, the Mets got burned so bad by that. Relievers are just so finicky year to year. So, I mean, I don't really see the Mets being in on a trade for uh, Lalaric or anyone else. Frankie Diaz, what are my thoughts on Shane Green? Man, I'd love to bring in Shane Green. I think he's been with the uh, Braves the last couple of years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's been a very solid reliever for most of his career. Let's take a look at his numbers. Uh, last year, 2.60 ERA pitching with, yes, that's correct, Atlanta. Uh, in 27.2 innings, he had a uh, 2.60 ERA, 3.81 FIP. Uh, let's take a look at his last full season. Wow. Well, First half with Detroit, 32 appearances, had a 1.18 ERA. Then he went to Atlanta halfway through the year in 2019, made 27 more appearances. His ERA was uh, 4.01, not as great. Um, let's take a look. How old is this guy? Shane Green. Shane Green is – wow. Oh, no, that's when he debuted. He was 25. How old is he now? Let's figure this out. He's 32 now. All right. So, I mean, you know, with relief pitchers, I don't get too caught up in their age. They're effective. They're effective. It doesn't really matter to me if they're older. Uh, yeah, man, I'd love to bring in Shane Green. I've said it at the beginning of this stream as well. Mets have got to bring in some bullpen help. I am not comfortable with the bullpen as it's currently comprised. No faith in Diaz. No faith in Familia. No faith in Batances. Uh, right now, the two guys that I really have trust for are Seth Lugo, who is hurt and going to miss probably the first month or two of the season, and then uh, possibly Trevor May. But even he, you know, I got to see that he he can actually pitch here in New York. You know, he's very good with Minnesota, great strikeout numbers, but I got to see him actually do it now for us. You know, everything can change when you join a new team. You just, you never know. Let's see. What do we got? The Mets got Lindor for that price because Cleveland's forced to trade him. Not the same situation as Bieber. All right. So, so someone must have said, yeah, Frankie mentioned uh, Shane Bieber. Man, that dude is, in my opinion, I think Shane Bieber's the second best pitcher in baseball after Jacob DeGrom. Garrett Cole, really good. Yeah. But Shane Bieber's, I, I've watched many of his starts, and that dude is probably the second best pitcher behind Jacob DeGrom. And it's very close. Like, it is very, very close. Uh, the the, the Indians would ask for a King's ransom for him. He's still, what, like three or four years left under control? I mean, that dude is insane, insanely good. And there's just no way they would trade him, nor should they. Still under cost control, so I don't see the, the Indians doing that. They'd have to be blown away. And at that point, they're signaling a full-blown rebuild. So don't see that happening as much as I'd love it. Uh, would instantly make the Mets, in my opinion, the World Series favorites if you get Shane Bieber behind uh, – Jacob DeGrom, but th that's fantasy land, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Pat, Pat, how do we say that? Patuator, patuator.com. Yeah, trading for relievers, not usually ideal. I mean, there's rare occasions like, you know, a guy like Josh Hader, but even that, you know, the, the Brewers earlier this offseason and last were asking for, for a ton of players, and it just doesn't make sense to trade a lot of prospect capital for uh, a, a reliever when they're so, you know, just – wishy-washy from year to year you never really know what you're getting out of them a bullpen sometimes man you just got to throw against the wall and see what sticks you know sometimes guys that you didn't, never expected to depend on become huge boons in your bullpen and the guys that you thought were going to do really well like edwin diaz are unpitchable and it, it, it really makes it tough You could probably go to 
uh, Puerto Rico in a bodega and find a reliever. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong about that, Mets Knicks. Uh, Texas Rangers report by CFM. Would I do a rough and no door trade for Familia and Batances? I mean, hell yeah, I would. I don't know what Odor's uh, contract situation is, but uh, let me take a look at that because if I if you tell me I could get rid of Familia and Batances, take them, please. I don't care. That'd be amazing. Odor's probably not signed to a very big contract, is he? Hmm. Actually, six years, forty nine and a half million. He signed through. I mean, he signed through two thousand twenty two. It's only two years left. Absolutely, man. I'd do that in a heartbeat. I don't think the Rangers would do it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if the Rangers came calling and I'm the Mets GM, you better believe I'd be doing that trade in a heartbeat. Got to get rid of Familia and Patances, man. That that's huge. So as far as Tejon Walker goes, what do you guys think? Should that be the Mets' final move for their rotation? Or would you prefer them to go after a guy like Kyle Hendricks or an even bigger long shot like Luis Castillo? Let me know in this comment section right over here, guys. I want to hear from you. Um, as far as Chris Bryant, what do you guys think about that? Are the Mets actually going to be in on Chris Bryant? Would they actually pull off a trade for him? And how far would you be willing to go as far as sending prospects back? Uh, I made it clear I'm not sending any of the top five guys in Mauricio, Alvarez, Brett Beatty, Matthew Allen, or Pete Crow Armstrong for one-year rental on Chris Bryant. If they're going to throw in Kyle Hendricks, I'll definitely consider throwing one of those guys in a trade. And to me, it'd probably be Ronnie Mauricio just because he's the guy that I'm least keen on out of our top five. I think Francisco Alvarez is a commodity being a catcher. There are so few good catchers in baseball. I know it's a few years away still, but his timeline matches up perfectly with when James McCann's uh, contract will be done with the Mets. So Francisco Alvarez, for me, is untouchable. Matthew Allen sounds like the second coming of Matt Harvey, except hopefully not as nuts of a character as Harvey was, uh, who, by the way, just signed a minor league deal with the Baltimore Orioles. Good for him. You know, I'm wishing him nothing but good luck. Uh and then Brett Beatty, he'd probably be the second guy that I'd be most willing to trade out of that top five group there. Uh, Brett Beatty, from what I can tell, sounds like he's going to move to the outfield at one point, probably be a left fielder, maybe a right fielder. Uh, I don't think he sticks at third base. He sounds like he's got the power tools to really develop into a big time hitter, but he's also a couple years away. So if the Mets were getting Kyle Hendricks as well as Chris Bryant, I definitely would be willing to send either Beatty or or Ronnie Mauricio back to the Cubs in that deal. But let me know. What do you guys think? I want to hear from you in this comment section right over here. Just get Walker. And yeah, you know, man, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Honestly, gives the Mets a full out, uh, you know, fill out rotation. Uh, it improves the bullpen. Hopefully Wilson comes back, pitches back to his 2019 form. And it leaves more cap flexibility for this team if they want to go out and acquire some guys at the trade deadline. Um, you know, the Mets still want to extend Francisco Lindor and Michael Conforto. So with the future outlook of that, it's probably beneficial for the Mets to stay under the luxury tax threshold in 2021. That way, if they need to go over in 21, in 22, 23, or any of those other years, they don't have to worry about having gone over it this year. So, you know, we got to build a sustainable winner here. And, you know, a lot of fans have become a little frustrated that, you know, we really were flaunting all this money, this new rich owner. Why didn't we sign any of these big names? George Springer was right there for us to get. But, you know, taking a look at that George Springer one just specifically didn't really make a lot of sense because he's probably moving to right field soon. And then, well, it's kind of a choice of do you want Springer at 31 right now or do you want Conforto, who will be 28 after this season? I'm taking Conforto at 28, who's already in right field, who's just now probably entering prime of his career while George Springer's probably going into the downward trend on his career. I still expect him to be a great player, but you know, for six years, I'm not sure uh, I would have wanted the mess to do that. So I'm happy we avoided that. Would you do Mauricio Davis Beatty for Chapman? It's tough, dude. That's tough, Michael. I mean, I think I would. Yeah, no, I would definitely do that. Mauricio, to me, I, I, I'm I, not super keen on him. I mean, like, I just feel like he's the Mets' number one prospect, but I don't feel like he gets hype from other teams and from other evaluators. I mean, it like, it just doesn't really do it for me, Mauricio, and I'd be willing to move him in the right deal. 
JD Davis, I love. I'd love to keep him on. He's got great chemistry, great clubhouse presence, best friends with all those dudes in there. But if you're bringing in Matt Chapman, I got to do that, man. I got to do that. I mean, we're talking about probably the best or arguably one of the best third basemen in baseball. Uh, I still think it's Nolan Arenado, but there's a big online Twitter argument every day I see about if it's Chapman or if it's Nolan Arenado, and it could easily be either of them. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely have to do that trade. Ronnie Mauricio, J.D. Davis, and Brett Beatty for Matt Chapman. Wrap it up. Let's go. Mets are ready to go to war at that point, man. Best lineup in baseball. Mets fan, what's up? Welcome. If you guys aren't already subbed to Mets fan from YouTube, check him out. He makes some great stuff, and we do live streams every Thursday with Mets fans only on uh, his YouTube channel. Uh, and We all get together, talk Mets and other things about Major League Baseball. So be sure to sub to Mets fan right here in the chat. Appreciate you checking in, my man. Let's see, what do we got here? Thinking about trading for relievers. The Cubs traded Glaber Torres for Chapman for a one-year deal. Yeah, you know, I mean, that situation was a little bit different when the Yankees traded for uh, for Araldis Chapman. They traded, or rather the Cubs traded Glaber Torres to the Yankees for Chapman. The Yankees were out of it by a deadline deal. Uh, they were not making the playoffs. They did a simple kind of retooling. Chapman was a free agent heading into the next offseason season. And, I mean, the Cubs were in a very distinct territory having a World Series drought of 108 years or whatever it was and were desperate, and they they capitalized. And, you know, say what you want. Yeah, they lost out on Labor Torres for his entire career, but they got their World Series. I don't think there's a Cubs fan in the world that, you know, is unhappy with that trade looking back now. They got their title. And how could you be upset by that? Yeah, strike blitz. I tend to agree with you, man. I, I think that Mauricio Beatty Davis deal for uh, Chapman might be a little light. They'll probably go for Alvarez. I mean, just to be frank, you know, I think that any deal for a superstar player like Chapman or a guy like Luis Castillo, teams are going to be asking for Francisco Alvarez because number one, he looks like the Mets' best prospect right now. Uh, he's still a few years away, but number two. He's a catcher, and those are very rare right now in baseball. There are so few good catchers. It's like the smallest uh, chart depth chart of position in, in all of Major League Baseball. Uh, you know, there's probably three really good catchers that you can rely on day in, day out in Major League Baseball, and that's JT Real Muto. I guess you could say Yasmani Grandal. Uh, and then I might throw Will Smith into the mix from the Dodgers, although even he's – Still not really emerged as a true star yet or anything, but I, I do like Will Smith quite a bit. He's a good player. Um, and then after that, you know, you have a few guys that are wishy-washy. You know, Gary Sanchez has been really bad the last two years. And you have Travis Darno, who either is hitting 300 with 20 home runs or he's on the DL for 80 games. So, you know, there's just not a lot of depth. And I think Francisco Alvarez is going to be the first person that every team asks for from the Mets in, in their when they're discussing a big trade like Matt Chapman or Luis Castillo or even Chris Bryant. Um, and yeah, you know, Michael, you're right. Sandy loves Alvarez. Um, Sandy's not big on trading, you know, big time names for, uh, you know, people that are about to set, set hit free agency. So, you know, I just, I don't really see that Chapman trade working out as much as I'd love it. And as much as I think it makes the Mets pro probably makes the Mets the enemy's favorites in my opinion. I just I don't really see that one happening. I think Chris Bryant is much more realistic, but as time's going on and there's no trades happening with Chris Bryant and the Cubs, I'm starting to think it's less and less likely. I just don't know what direction the Cubs are going in. Like are they rebuilding? Are they retooling? Are they like blowing it up? I, I just don't know. They have so many guys that are set to hit free agency this year with Anthony Rizzo, with Javi Baez, with Chris Bryant. They traded you Darvish. So it's like, you know, are they extending these guys? Are they trading them to cash in before they hit free agency? Like, I don't know what the Cubs plan is. Cause meanwhile, they bring back, they trade Dexter Fowler. Then they, no wait, Dexter Fowler, sorry, was with St. Louis. Sorry, that was wrong. But they, they, they non-tendered Kyle Schwarber. Sorry. And then they signed Jake Marisnik. I just, you know, they bring in Jock Peterson. Like, are they trying to win or they're trying to retool? Or like, I don't know what the Cubs are trying to do. So I'm I'm in as much of a gray area with that trade as anyone else, to be honest. 
John Talento, LFGM, baby. Let's go. I like it. Boys, ladies and boys and girls, I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you guys. If you're not already subbed to my channel, be sure to subscribe to Tony Metro right here on this stream. I cover all the latest news on Major League Baseball and, of course, my beloved New York Mets. For those of you guys that didn't watch our live stream the other night, you definitely got to check it out. We were all asked to share our favorite Mets memory. So I had to. This bat right behind me actually was given to me by former Met Moises Alou at Shea Stadium, pictured above. I was standing on the dugout actually waiting to get something from him. You know, me and a bunch of other Mets fans couldn't really find it. You know, he wouldn't throw us a ball. And then he goes into the dugout steps and he throws his bat that he used during BP and it goes right into my arm. So that's that bat right there. This ball, this, right? Yeah, no, this one, this one right here, this ball right here was me catching Noah Syndergaard's home run at Dodger Stadium. And this is me on the SMY broadcast with me and my buddies holding the baseball in my hand. So those are my two favorite Mets memories. We talk about all things Mets and Major League Baseball on that stream. It's every Thursday night at 3 or 4 Eastern time. We kind of vary on the times. But check out my Twitter, Tony Metro MLB, and I'll post all about that and let you know when we are going to be posting that. So thank you guys for joining this right now. Let's get back to the comments real quick. I'm going to go another 10 minutes, and then i got to take the dog out for a walk. i got a little German Shepherd puppy named Mookie, Mookie Wilson, of course, and he's the best boy ever. Let's see. Yeah, Chapman's under control three more years, man, so he's going to be costly. That's why I say it's going to be at least a guy like Francisco Alvarez, Ronnie Mauricio, and probably J.D. Davis, if not even more than that. I just don't see the athletics trading him. And the athletics don't look super competitive right now, but do they ever? They always on paper like don't look very good, but then go off and win 93 games and then inevitably lose in the first round of the playoffs. But that's besides the point. They make the playoffs almost every year, it seems like. So not getting the athletics out yet. I don't think they're going to sell on Chapman at this point. Uh, would you rather the Mets trade for Suarez and Gray, Bryant and Hendricks, or Chapman? I mean, I would rather be Chapman. I just don't see the athletics trading him, like I said. I like Sonny Gray, but I don't love him. I would way prefer Hendricks. And I like Bryant better than Suarez. So to answer your question, I would go, I would go Bryant and Hendricks for sure. I think the Reds are asking for even more for Sonny Gray and Eugenio Suarez than the Cubs are asking for Chris Bryant and Kyle Hendricks. So to me, I'm with that deal because I also like the idea that Bryant is just a rental. It lowers the Mets' price in terms of a trade, and they can recoup a draft pick if he walks after the next season before free agency. So to me personally, I would rather trade and deal with the Cubs than with the Reds. I, I don't know if I'm a big believer in Sonny Gray. I know that I'm not, I'm not saying he can't pitch in New York because of his time with the Yankees, which was not very good. I just personally, at this point in his career, I'm not interested in taking a chance on him. I'd rather go with Kyle Hendricks, who seems a very even keel personality. I think he'd be fine in New York. Very, very, very team-friendly contract. Um, and I think the Cubs will ask for less than the Reds would. And I also think Suarez is just not a very good defensive third baseman. I think his numbers, his power numbers are inflated from playing at Great American Ballpark and other small yards in the National League Central. So not too keen on uh, Eugenio Suarez either. Still need a solid center fielder. I hope one of these kids have surprises this year. Yeah, man, you know, I've been saying for a long time on our streams that center field defense needed to be addressed. I think they're done there. I mean, I really would have liked them to have done something. You know, if Jackie Bradley Jr. was a right-handed hitter, I think he'd be on the Mets right now, uh, depending on what his agent Scott Boris is asking for. But he's left-handed. He really was not a fit. His offensive profile, pretty bad. Uh, great defensive center fielder. But the Mets brought in Albert Almora Jr. He's a pretty solid defensive center fielder. I really do believe that he is the Mets' plan now to be mixed in with Brandon Nimmo. And like I said before, Khalil Lee, the newly acquired Mets prospect, I think he's going to spend quite a bit of time with the major league team this year. Uh, so I think they're done in center field as far as defense. And I think between those three guys, they'll be okay. You mix and match that. You have Dom Smith in left field for most of the game until you got to move him over, get Brandon Nimmo in left, bring in Albora or Khalil Lee to play center field toward the end of games when you need a more defensive-minded uh, center fielder out there. 
Yeah, and strike blitz, man, I agree with you. You know, they non the Cubs non tender Kyle Schwarber. They traded you Darvish. They didn't get very much back for you Darvish, and it doesn't seem like they're really trying to go in this year. But then at the same time, they go out, they sign Jake Marisnik, and they sign Jock Peterson, and they don't seem to be all too much in a hurry sending Baez or Rizzo or Bryant or trading them. So they're sending mixed signals. Really can't figure out what the Cubs are trying to do right now and in the future. And they're in a little bit of a transition period, having lost. Uh, uh, Theo Epstein and, and now with Jed Hoyer running the show. So I, I think that's a big reason why they look like they're kind of in a flux right now. I think they actually are trying to figure out themselves what they want to do. That's right. You got to find that ticket, Mets fan, bro. I can't believe you got to find that, man. Mets fan from YouTube has a signed ticket from the 1986 Game 6 World Series signed by Mookie Wilson, and he cannot find it. Everyone go roast this guy in his channel. What are you doing? Come on, man. Got to find that. Send it to me and I'll I'll uh, make sure it stays safe. I'll keep it for you. <laughs> Brian and Baez due for free agency. What hobby? wonder what hobbies. Yeah. I, you know, here's the thing, though. All these free agent source stops next year, you got Corey Seager, Francisco Lindor, if he doesn't get extended, Javi, Trevor Story, and Carlos Correa. All free agents next year. So, they might all be competing with each other and that might drive their costs down. It's a buyer's market at that point. You know, it's going to be a better market for teams and they might be able to say, you oh, know, I'm not giving you 150 million. I'm not giving you 200 million like you want. I'm going to give this guy 120. So why should I give you 200? You're comparable player. So if I'm Javi Baez, if I'm Francisco Lindor, Trevor Story, I'm signing an extension with my team right now. If money's equal and it's close to what I'd expect to get in free agency. So that's something to look out for with all the talented shortstops next off season. Definitely something to be that I'll be interested to see as well. Good. Very good point right there. Mets Knicks, bro. Bory, Bory, bro. <laughs> no safe streets in Chicago. I haven't been to Chicago, so I don't know. I actually live in LA and uh, I'll tell you what, downtown LA is ugh, not good. You don't want to be out in downtown LA too long. It is not a fun area to be in. It's not dangerous. It's just not the cleanest or uh, I guess, yeah, it's not that safe either, to be honest. Luis Castillo would be the prize, says Sap Pucky and Dom. Hate to see Dom go, but Castillo is insane. Yeah, man, you know, I, I just don't see uh, – I don't see the Mets trading Dom Smith. I mean, the DH is imminent. It is going to be coming next year. If not this year, I mean, they already said no, but I could see that changing at the last minute. I don't see the Mets trading Dom Smith. They'd be giving up a lot of potential talent in the guy that, you know, it looks like he's emerging as one of the better hitters in baseball. As soon as the DH opens up, you know, they'll probably have Pete Alonso DH, put Dom at first, uh, and then they won't have to worry about, you know, trying to, you know, fit a round hole or rather a square peg into a round hole, whatever the saying is of, of having to put Dom Smith in the outfield where he really doesn't belong. Um, although I did see that he made some strides out there, both him and JD Davis made strides out there, but they're still prone to have a gaff out there and have some misplays. And it's just not something I, I personally over the last few years have really started to value defense a lot more after watching the Mets try to force players into positions that they're not comfortable in. And it's hurt this team quite a bit. I mean, even one example right away, Ahmed Rosario and Dom Smith colliding on that fly ball in left field in the middle of 2019. I mean, you know, when you have an experienced guys out there that don't belong in a position, it's going to cost you games. I say let JD play third for and for Luis Castillo. Okay, but what's the trade that you want for Luis Castillo? You want to keep JD Davis at third base. And get Luis Castillo. All right, so let's just forget, you know, let's just pretend the Mets traded for Luis Castillo and it was all prospects and now he's in their rotation. You're saying keep J.D. Davis at third base. Um, I'm okay with J.D. Davis playing some third base, but I don't think he can be an everyday third baseman. The guy's just kind of a butcher out there. You know, he is not a smooth fielder. His arm is very strong but inconsistent. It's not very accurate a lot of the time. I don't know if I can tolerate a full year of J.D. Davis being a third baseman. Um, you know, 
if they give him the assignment in the beginning of spring training, JD, you're going to play third base exclusively this year. This is what I want you to practice. Do balls every day. You're going to be getting reps there during spring training. I think he could develop into a guy that's just good enough that, that his bat will erase the negative side of his defense, that he'll just do enough at third base to still be a valuable player because of his bat. But last year they said, oh, he's going to play left. He's going to play third. We don't really know. There's DH. like. And that's what I think happened with Jeff McNeil as well. Like we thought he was going to play second or third or left. Sometimes you really got to give these guys these assignments in spring training. Got to give them these reps. Round peg and round peg square hole. That's what I meant to say. Strike blitz. Thank you. Um, and JD Davis is another example of round peg square hole. He's really a third baseman by trade. They tried to put him in left field and he wasn't terrible out there, but he's definitely not a left fielder. When you put him out there and then you also have Brandon Nimmo in center who is okay, but doesn't cover enough ground in center field to be, you know, deemed a true center fielder. The Mets off outfield defense is hurt and any value they bring as hitters is completely diminished because they're the Mets are losing runs from their poor defense out there. So they got to figure something out. I think center field's good now. They're going to do Nimmo, Alvin Amora, maybe some Khalil Lee in there. They also have Malik Smith, who's going to be probably in AAA, um, but could be called up at any point. Um, and then they have Heredia as well, who the Mets must see something in because he is still on this team, all to my surprise, and I think many other Mets fans' surprise. Um, so I don't know. I, I think they're good in center. I think uh, left field will probably be a mix of Brandon Nimmo, Dom Smith, maybe even some Jeff McNeil, who I'm very comfortable with playing left field. But he'll probably more exclusively be at second base. Um, J.D. Davis at third, it's, it's a tough one for me. It's tough for me to say I can, I'm comfortable with him being the everyday third baseman based on uh, the defense that we have seen from him. So, guys, I'm going to wrap this up real quick, though. Let me know. What are your guys' thoughts? Do you want Tejon Walker? Do you want the Mets to trade for Chris Bryant? And if not, who would you rather them try to bring in to finish this offseason, to put an exclamation mark on this offseason and push them toward World Series contention? As I said, right now, how they stand, I think that their max is 95 wins. I think that they're probably closer to 89 right now. Um, if all goes well, this team could win 95, but I think they're probably closer to 89. Bringing in a guy like Tejon Walker, bringing in a guy maybe like Chris Pine, where does that put them if they were to do one of those things or both of them? Let me know in the comments section over here on the right. And as I said, of course, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. You guys are awesome. This was so fun. I'm going to keep doing these at least once, maybe twice a week starting now. Um, and I want to keep hearing from you guys. Let me know what you guys think. And if you're not already subscribed, be sure to subscribe to my channel. Stay up to date on all the latest Mets and Major League Baseball news. And also follow me on Twitter, Tony Metro MLB, so you can stay up to date on all of our live streams, which are on Thursdays, 4 p.m. Eastern time. And you guys will be able to hear from me and many other Mets fans here on YouTube, as well as some Red Sox fans. We also have some Angel fans that I think are going to be joining us very soon. We just talk baseball for a couple hours every Thursday night. So thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate it. I'm your host, Tony Metro. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Enjoy your Valentine's Day. Get out there. Go get your girl some chocolates or your boy and have a great rest of your day, guys. Take care.